So thank you everyone for being here today. I know that it's a very beautiful day outside and it was probably hard to come inside and listen to a presentation, but um, I'm excited that you came. And my name is Melissa Miller. I'm one of the therapists over at Counseling Services. I've been at K-State for about two years now. And the reason that I am passionate about this topic is because it's something that I myself have struggled with and continue struggling with. And so it's something that is a work in progress for me as well. And I think it's just a very important topic that a lot of the students that come in to see us over at Counseling Services are struggling with perfectionism and it's affecting their lives and their studies in some pretty significant ways. So I think it's something that is a good conversation for us to have and talk about some ways that we can help combat perfectionism. So let's start off with talking about um, what is perfectionism. So perfectionism, I just Googled the definition, so not very scholarly, but you know, it is what it is. So on Google, perfectionism is a refusal to accept any standard short of perfection. So I thought that was a pretty strong wording. You know, you hear the word refusal, and it's this idea of nothing short of that standard. There's no giving in, it's just a very solid, like here's our bar, we either hit it or we don't. And I think that one of the struggles with having this bar so high is that we very ever rarely meet that bar. Um, and so it kind of sets us up for this constant like journey of trying to reach this perfectionism, but then falling short because there's this strong refusal to accept anything less than that. So what is the problem with perfectionism. So it's something that everybody seems to be chasing after, or I would say most of us are chasing after. So what exactly is the problem with that? So like I was just talking about, I think that perfect is very often a myth. There's, there are few things where you can actually achieve perfection, but typically it's just a very subjective experience. You can't actually reach that level of perfect, or it looks different for different people. So again, it's just this very subjective guideline that we're going off of, and it may look different for different folks. So you might be trying to achieve perfection of what you consider perfection. Your parents may have a different idea of perfection. Your professors may have a different idea of perfection. And so it's just so hard to reach this standard of what that is. Along with that, I think perfectionism comes at a pretty high cost. So what I want to do for a couple of minutes is brainstorm what are some of the costs of perfectionism. So, um, you know, I mentioned a few of just, you know, perfectionism is very subjective, but what are some of the actual costs or consequences of pursuing perfection? And this can be in your own personal life, maybe some of your own personal experiences, or it can be a very general something that you've seen among your friends or others. So I'll give you a second to think about it, and then if you would like to share, I'd love to have some answers from some of you about um, how perfectionism has cost you or some of the other costs you see. All right, if anybody has something, let me know and I'll bring you the microphone. Any volunteers? Or if you feel more comfortable, you can shout it out and I'll just repeat it in the microphone. <laughs> you go ahead. Yeah, so health and sleep, definitely. What else? Yes. Self esteem. Self esteem, yeah. Never feeling satisfied. Time consuming. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sacrificing fun. Definitely. Risk for burnout. Yes. 
Anybody on Zoom want to chime in with some of the costs of perfectionism? Okay, okay. All right. So here are some of the ones that I came up with, very similar to what you all said. So that time element, um, especially if you're working on an assignment, I think something that I see often with students is that they tend to procrastinate a lot. And a lot of students kind of have this idea of, well, maybe I'm just being lazy or maybe I'm just not a good student. And often when we actually start talking about it, it's because of this perfectionism. They don't even know where to start with it because they have such high standards for themselves. And so that time element, or maybe it, it becomes like doing the assignment over and over and over again because you're trying to get it a certain way. So that's another way that that time element um, comes into play. And then we have the energy. Um, it takes a lot of energy, even just thinking about trying to do something perfectly, that brain energy, and then even the physical energy with that. I didn't have sleep on here, but you all got that one. I didn't have that one. Money. So if you're maybe trying to look a certain way, people spend tons of money on the beauty industry, on gym memberships, some of those things. So if you're trying to get that perfect body image, it comes out in those ways, diets, any of those things. Mental health, I think that a lot of our anxiety and depression and even sometimes suicidal thoughts stems from these perfectionistic beliefs that we have. Peace of mind, quality of life, enjoyment. You mentioned sacrificing fun, absolutely. Relationships, how might perfectionism affect relationships? Yes, absolutely. So seeing some of those things like in movies or thinking it should be a certain way, seeing standards from family and then being disappointed when it's not that way. Yeah, definitely. Also along with that, I think sometimes if we're expecting our partners to be perfect, we've got really high expectations and we have this like should or must thinking, well, they should do this, they must be doing it this way, they have to do it this way. And when they don't, then it can create a lot of tension in the relationship if other people aren't meeting our standards for that. Yeah. Variety, I think if everybody is so focused on being perfect, if the world really was perfect, I think it would limit a lot of our creativity and variety. And those are things that, you know, we're all individuals. We all have these different things that we bring to situations. And so if there was this perfect standard that we could meet, it would really limit a lot of those good aspects of variety and creativity. And then funny moments. So again, if everything was perfect, we wouldn't have like blooper reels in movies. And how many of us love watching those because they're just so silly? Or thinking about some of the things that maybe you laugh about with your friends or with your family members. A lot of times it's situations that have gone not the way that they were supposed to go. And those are the things that we laugh about. And so if there was just perfect everything, we wouldn't have a lot of these fun moments. All right. Not okay, so one of the things that I believe is behind a lot of our perfectionist beliefs and behaviors that we have are areas of underlying shame. And this is definitely not a fun topic to talk about. I think even the word shame is really uncomfortable for most of us. So one of the experts, I guess, on shame in in the world right now is Brene Brown. Has anybody heard of Brene Brown before or some of her work? A few people, okay. So she's very big in the social work world. She is a social worker, um, but she also does a lot of research on shame and how it impacts people. And this is her definition of shame. 
So she says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Shame creates feelings of fear, blame, and disconnection. So I'm going to read that one more time just because it's a lot to unpack in one quote. So shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Shame creates feelings of fear, blame, and disconnection. So if you think about some of the areas that maybe we struggle with perfection in, whether that's school or relationships, professional lives, some of those things, a lot of times we experience this shame when we feel like we're not measuring up to our standards that we have set for ourselves or the standards that we feel like other people have set for us. And then when we experience this shame, it creates a lot of fear, blame, or disconnection. So that's how it starts impacting our other relationships and the things that are going around us. So when we start having these feelings and experiences of shame, we start pulling back from a lot of the people or activities that we really want to be involved in. But because of feeling shame, that's when we start having this disconnection. So with the shame, I think that there's specific areas that we tend to feel shame around. And so according to Brene Brown, there are 12 common areas in which women struggle the most with feelings of shame. Those are appearance and body image, motherhood, family, parenting, money and work, mental and physical health, sex, aging, religion, being stereotyped and labeled, speaking out, having trauma. And then she explains that with men, so the, the way that shame affects us is similar. Men and women, however, experience the expectations a little bit differently. So with men, men tend to experience shame if they believe they're being perceived as weak. And that's in any of those categories that tend to be the areas for women. So what I'd like you to do is maybe think about what primary areas that you most often find yourself experiencing feelings of shame. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to share this one out loud unless you want to. So if somebody wants to share, you can. But I know this one's a little bit more sensitive question. So just think a minute about which areas you often find yourself experiencing that shame. Was that pretty hard to figure out which one it was, or was it pretty obvious to most of you? Pretty easy? Okay. Yeah. And it's interesting how sometimes these overlap. So, for example, my I am a newer mother. I have an eight-month-old baby at home, and so one of my more recent ones is motherhood. And it's interesting because I think that that one and my work one, um, I think at times conflict because I want to be really awesome at my job and very committed and here all the time, not all the time, but during work times. Um, and then with a mom, I also want to be fully present for him and able to do all these things for my child. And then things happen like, where his daycare is closed, or maybe he's sick, and so I have to be out of work. And so there have been a couple of times this semester that I've been at home wrestling with, like, all right, I'm here at home with my sick child, which is where I want to be. I want to be taking care of him, but now I've got clients at work who aren't being able to be seen, or I feel like I'm letting some of my coworkers down because I'm not able to be there. And so do you see how with some of these things, like you can't be 100 percent or over a hundred percent like we want to be in both of those things at the same time. It's just not possible. 
And so often we have these high, high expectations in multiple areas, and we just don't have the time, energy, or resources to be amazing in all of those different areas. So what do we do with that? If that's a struggle for most of us, how do we wrap our minds around that and um, learn to be okay with that in a sense? So one of the things that we can do is work on building self-compassion. And self-compassion, has anybody heard that term before? Anybody? Okay. One of you. <laughs> so really what self-compassion is, it's basically just taking compassion and showing it to yourself. So I think most of us are familiar with compassion. How, how would you all define what compassion is? What does that look like if we show compassion to somebody else? So having empathy, understanding, not judging, trying to understand that person's perspective. Yeah. I think you summed it up pretty well with that. Yeah. So self-compassion is taking that and trying to do that same thing for yourself. So learning to have empathy with yourself, learning to have understanding with yourself, show a little patience with yourself. So that's how we can take that compassion and then turn that towards ourselves. So it's not trying to change the situation and say, you know, oh, this isn't a big deal, whatever. It's more about how can you treat yourself with that compassion. So in the example that I used where I was at home with my sick child and feeling conflicted about not being at work and then being at home. So showing myself compassion would be instead of thinking things like, oh, like you're failing at work or you're letting all these people down, it would be like, wow, this is really hard that you're having to be here when you really want to be in two places at once. And, you know, man, it's just there's a lot going on in your plate right now. And it's okay that this is really difficult. It's okay that you're having a rough day. So it's basically taking the way that you would talk to a friend or family member or somebody you really care about if they were in a hard situation, and it's learning to do that with yourself and talk to yourself in that way. So one way that you can increase your own self-compassion is by practicing it, really, by doing some different exercises. So what I have here is an exercise that's by Kristen Neff, and this is off of her website, which is um, selfcompassion.org. And she has a lot of different exercises and free res resources on her website. So we're going to go ahead and do this exercise. So it says if you will take out a sheet of paper or your computer is fine as well. If you don't have paper, if you'll just think about it for a few minutes, that's okay too. Um, but the exercise is called how would you treat a friend? So I'll go ahead and read the prompt. So it says, first, think about times when a close friend feels really bad about him or herself or is really struggling in some way. How would you respond to your friend in this situation, especially when you're at your best? Please write down what you typically do, what you say, and note the tone in which you typically talk to your friends. So I'll let you start with that, and then we'll go from there.
Okay. So now think about times when you feel bad about yourself or are struggling. How do you typically respond to yourself in these situations? Please write down what you typically do, what you say, and note the tone in which you talk to yourself. So did you notice a difference between those two different examples? If so, ask yourself why. What factors or fears come into play that lead you to treat yourself and others so differently? And with this one, if somebody is willing to share out loud, that would be great. So did you notice a difference? And what do you think comes into play that leads you to treat yourself and others so differently? Okay, so comparing to others and holding yourself to different standards or feeling like maybe there's different expectations for you or the other person. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to share theirs? Okay, go ahead. There are two parts to that. So that growing up with that tough love and being what you're used to. And then the second part you said, realizing it's not as effective for other people. I think a lot of times we think that we're motivating ourselves by that tough love approach or being really highly critical with ourselves. And I like to think of, you know, if you're trying to get some work done, let's say you're in your room studying or trying to write a report, something like that, and you have somebody standing there yelling at you, telling you how stupid you are, telling you to hurry up, telling you you're never going to get it done, how motivated do you think you're going to be to finish that paper? Lots of head shaking. It's really not going to work that well. But for some reason, we think that talking to ourselves that way internally is going to motivate us. And it really does not work that often. It may work for a time. It may make you feel like, oh, I need to get my butt in gear and get going. But long-term wise, it's, you're going to get to the point where it's just like, nope, I'm done, thrown in the towel. I can't do this anymore. And that's what tends to happen when you have that sort of motivation. So it might work short-term, but in the long-term, it's, it's not helpful and it's not very motivating. But I think when you've grown up with something like that, it can be really hard to change the way you think and the way that you talk to yourself. Absolutely. Good thoughts on that. Okay. So I think with, with that, this type of exercise is one of the best ways to really practice having that compassion with yourself. And I think that's one of the most effective ways to start 
making that transition, it's really hard to catch yourself not being compassionate with yourself when you're so used to treating yourself in a different way or being really hard on yourself. So I think having these times where maybe you can practice some of these journaling exercises or at least even think about these types of things is a really good way to start making that shift in how you talk to yourself, just having some time to reflect. And I did print off in the handout and at the end of this PowerPoint, the last slide, there's some resources for Kristen Neff's website, so that's on there. And then also Brene Brown's website and her books, and those are all really good resources to check out if you wanna learn some more about these specific topics. Plenty of other exercises to try to continue working on that area. So another thing that we can do to combat perfectionism is to have values-based living. So we've got our values-based living and then we have our goal-oriented mindset. And with goals, often goals are very black and white. There's something that's really specific that we're trying to work toward. And then once it's done, it's just over, it's there. So if you're trying to get like a 4.0, that's a goal, and then you either get the 4.0 or you don't. So it's either one of these all or nothing type situations. What a value is, is a way that you want to act and a way that you want to live your life. And I think of values as more of a direction. So if you think about wanting to move in this certain direction, there's not really a set end point, but it's just something to keep moving toward. So. Further example of this one, if you think about your health, I could have a goal to not have any soda all week. And then if I, let's say on a Thursday afternoon, I am just out with some friends, I order a soda, not even thinking about it. And then later I realize like, oh crap, like I just completely messed up my goal. I failed, it's just over for the week. So I've had one this week, done deal, it's over. Whereas if my value is I want to live a more healthy lifestyle, and then along with that, one of the steps I'm gonna take is reduce the sodas that I have for the week. So then I have one soda, not thinking about it. And then I look at the rest of the week and I say, hey, the rest of the week I didn't have soda, so I'm still moving toward health for all these other days that I made a healthier choice. It's not an all or nothing thing. It's, hey, I'm still moving in the right direction here because of all these other days that I've been living by this value of being more healthy. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference with that? Okay, so I have this worksheet that is the values, a quick look at your values. So if everyone can pull that one out. Did you get one of these? And this is from thehappinesstrap.com by Russ Harris. He has a book of the same title. And on here he has 60, well, 58 different values and then two that you can list your own if there's one that's not listed in the 60 that are here. So what I'd like you to do is spend a couple of minutes, look through this list and pick a couple of these, or even several of these, when I have clients do these, a lot of times people come up with about 10-ish, somewhere around there. But if you can look through and pick some of yours that you would consider to be your top values, and then we will chat a little bit more after you do that.
Okay, so just out of curiosity, how many are you funding you're able to get them limited down to? Seven? Okay, awesome. I think what makes this activity difficult is that they all seem like good things. They're all values, and so I think we think of them as good things. And it's just narrowing down what are my specific values? What are the things that I either currently value and am passionate about, or what do I want to be passionate about? Where do I want to be? All right, so just to summarize everything that we've talked about today. So we talked about how perfectionism is this really rigid standard and how perfect itself is pretty much a myth in most cases and it's a very subjective experience. So we talked about the costs of perfectionism and how it really takes away a lot of that quality of our lives, peace of mind. And then two of the ways to really combat perfectionism are to increase your self-compassion and to have values-based living. And then we also talked about shame and identifying those shame triggers too. So I guess three different things. So looking at your shame triggers, doing some more exploring with that, trying to increase your values, and then increasing self-compassion. So what I'd like you to do, because I know that that's a lot, and being perfectionists, we want to try and tackle all of those things. So what I'd like you to do is maybe pick one of those areas, the shame triggers, self-compassion, or values-based living. So just pick one of those, and then think of one thing that you can do in the next week to maybe build on that area. And it could be a, something as simple as just checking out one of these websites that I have listed here. So I want it to be something that feels doable. Somebody willing to share what their their thing is that they want to try and implement? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. I like that. So really trying to work on that self-compassion, even writing out what you would say to someone else in that situation. I think that's great. So thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to share theirs? Yeah, go ahead. having more of that values mindset. And I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to point out, I'm not saying goals are bad. <laughs> I think it's good to have goals, but I think if you can have them under that umbrella of your values, then when you don't quite get to your goal, then you've got some of that leeway there and you don't feel like, oh, it's done, so now I'm just going to go on a spree here and get way off track. You can still feel like you're somewhat on the track or get back on pretty easily. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else want to share what they're planning to do differently? Okay. Well, here are the resources that I mentioned today. So there are the four different books, The Happiness Trap, The Confidence Gap. Those are by Russ Harris, and that's where that values-based living piece came from. And then I thought, 
<coughs> excuse me, I thought it was just me, but it isn't by Brene Brown. She also has several other books about shame and just about living courageously and then her website as well. And then Self-Compassion is a book by Kristen Neff, and it talks all about how to increase that self-compassion. And then her website, that's where that journaling exercise came from, and she has several other journaling exercises. And I think she also has some audio meditations on there as well that you can check out. So, And then if you're doing some of these things, especially with the shame triggers area, if you start exploring through those and you're finding that you're just still really struggling with a lot of these core beliefs and perfectionism to the point that it's interfering with functioning or your emotional health, mental health, please seek out professional help. So we're available at counseling services. There's also several different community resources available, people who would be happy to help. Um, and if you're not wanting to come to counseling services, we can always help connect you with resources in the community. So even if you want a community provider and you're not sure how to get connected, come see us and we'll, we'll help send you in the right direction. Okay? All right. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.